Moneyball has become a buzzword in football over the last decade. In reference to the book, later made into a film starring Brad Pitt about Billy Bean's transformation of the Oakland Athletics and US baseball, it encapsulates the idea that by using cutting edge analysis in identifying undervalued players in the transfer market, clubs with small budgets can take on bigger, wealthier rivals and succeed. And with promotion to the English Premier League, the most lucrative prize in football, worth an estimated £180 million to those which achieve it, it's no surprise that this way of thinking has been adopted by some clubs in the Championship in recent seasons. Two of the clubs most closely associated with the Moneyball concept, Brentford and Barnsley, have been among the division's most talked about sides over the last two years, both harbouring ambitions of entry into the world's most valuable league through a sustainable business model. On today's FD Explained, we're going to take a look at how both clubs achieved their current success. After lifelong fan and professional gambler Matthew Benham became majority shareholder in 2012, Brentford underwent a gradual makeover which has seen them gain international acclaim and make their biggest play for promotion to the top flight since the Second World War. Benham had previously injected money into the West London outfit to help them overcome financial difficulties, and his background as the founder and owner of Smart Odds, a company which provides statistical analysis and sports modelling services to professional gamblers, hinted at the kind of approach he would take in running the club. Having first-hand access to Smart Odds resources instantly put the bees at an advantage in the transfer market over the many rivals which had yet to even invest in analytics, with co-director of football Rasmus Ankerson stating in 2015, Brentford can't win by outspending the competition, so we have to outthink them. That year, the club recorded a turnover of £3.3 million, the lowest in the championship and in Griffin Park had one of the smallest stadiums in the Division 2. Back in Benham's first season at the helm, the Bees had finished third in League One, their highest placing in eight seasons, and they went one better the following campaign, winning 28 games and notching up 94 points, both club records, achieving promotion to the second tier for the first time since 1993. In those first two seasons, the club made a number of astute signings. Adam Forshaw arrived from Everton on a free, Stuart Dallas signed his first professional contract after moving from Northern Irish outfit Crusaders, James Tarkovsky was bought from Oldham for a small undisclosed fee, and Will Grigg was signed from Warsaw for just under £350,000. They were eventually sold for a combined £10 million, an early indication of the club's ability to find undervalued players before bigger sides took notice of them. And in hindsight, these moves seem obvious. Grigg had scored 20 goals for Walsall the season before he signed, while Dallas had been named Player of the Year and Young Player of the Year at the Northern Ireland Football Writers Awards in 2011. Following seasons would see their recruitment strategy go up a level. In 2014, they signed strikers Scott Hogan and Andre Gray for less than £1.5 million combined, and within two years had collected £20.6 million for the pair and by the late 2010s they'd effectively become a feeder club for the Premier League. In 2017, they signed Neil Mopai and Ollie Watkins for a combined £8.3 million and eventually sold them to Brighton and Aston Villa for a combined £50.6 million. The following year, they bought Esri Konta inside Banrama for £4.1 million and within 18 months had made a £32.6 million profit on them. And their latest success story is of course Ivan Tony, who was signed for £5 million and is now valued at over £30 million following a record record-breaking season in the championship. Between 2015 and 2021, Brentford turned a profit in every transfer window, only spending over £10 million once and achieving a lower net spend than any other championship club. And yet, they've been able to stay competitive season on season, not once falling into relegation trouble and fighting hard for promotion in each of the last two campaigns. But how have they been so effective in the market? Over the last decade, the club has used a combination of traditional scouting methods, for example watching a player live for 5-10 to 10 matches, and mathematical modelling, for example expected goals and tracking data to identify their targets, as well as using detailed character assessments to make sure said targets will buy into the Brentford project and fit in with the dressing room. In 2015, the club restructured, adopting the head coach and director of football model, in doing so shifting power away from the manager on transfer policy, a setup which suited both former boss Dean Smith and current head coach Thomas Frank, 
able to focus more of their attention on tactics and creating a harmonious team environment. In 2016, they closed their academy, which was costing the club £1.5 million a year, had last produced a first team regular in 2005, and was seeing its top talents poached by Premier League giants for £30,000 a pop. They replaced it with a B team, which incorporated their remaining youth players with a batch of newcomers, aged 17 to 20, and recruited from Premier League academies where they were no longer wanted. As Robert Rowan, the club's late former technical director, said in 2017, we know everything about every player in the under 18s at Tottenham. This facilitated the move for Josh Da Silva, who signed from Arsenal for free at 19 and is now one of the side's key players. And when Thomas Frank was first hired in 2016, he was given the job of looking after players as they transitioned between the B team and senior side. The club's change in approach was influenced by Benham's decision to buy Danish outfit FC Midtjylland in 2014. Working with chairman Rasmus Ankersen, who was given his position at Brentford within a year, Benham set about targeting players from undervalued competitions like the Turkish Super League and German second tier. Within a year, they'd won their first ever Danish title and have gone on to add another two since. Midtjylland's success inspired Benham to do something similar in West London. Whereas before they had primarily targeted players in the English pyramid, they now set their net wider into the continent, a move which saw them pick up the likes of Mopai and Ben Rama. And by 2019, they had built such a well-functioning side that even when Mopai, who'd scored 25 goals that season, was sold, Ollie Watkins was good enough to move from the wing to centre forward and take his place, subsequently scoring 26 goals. But on the final day of the 2019-20 season, Brentford were denied automatic promotion to the Prem after losing to Barnsley, who avoided relegation by a point with a 91st minute winner. The victory was crucial for the Yorkshire club, who less than three years earlier had begun their own Moneyball story. In 2017, the Tykes were bought by a consortium featuring then niece owner Chien Li and the Pacific Media Group, with Moneyball protagonist Billy Bean even becoming a shareholder himself, having already taken up an advisory role at Dutch outfit LZ Alkmaar. And there was good reason for their interest. Barnsley's academy had an excellent reputation, producing both John Stones and Mason Holgate in the years before the takeover. Coupled with the youngest squad in the championship, with an average age of just 22, and the conditions were ideal for a long-term project. Barnsley were relegated from the second tier that season, but bounced straight back up the following year, owing not to increased spending, but the hiring of Daniel Stendhal as manager. Out of work for over a year when he was appointed, Stendhal had only managed 34 games at senior level, but in that time had helped Hanover gain promotion to the Bundesliga, with his high-pressing philosophy attracting Barnsley's new bosses. The young squad he inherited quickly took to his methods, losing just seven games on their way to automatic promotion, and the two managers who have succeeded him have followed a similar trend. In 2019, Stendhal was replaced by Gerhard Struber, who had learned his trade in Red Bull's highly organised setup, coaching Salzburg at youth level before impressing during a short stint with Austrian rivals Wolfsberger. Tactically flexible and using a number of different formations, Struber continued Stendhal's work, making the side even more aggressive with their pressing all over the pitch, with only Marcelo Bielsa's leads allowing opponents fewer passes per defensive action in 2019-20. Struber then left to manage New York Red Bulls in the MLS, and the club again looked to Austria, hiring Valerian Ismail, whose last side had beaten PSV, Sporting Club de Portugal, and RZ Alkmaar in the 1920 Europa League. Ismail's side had been one of the best in Europe for counter-pressing that season, and this was a defining factor in Barnsley offering him the job. On announcement, CEO Dane Murphy stated, his style of play will complement our philosophy. Barnsley's player recruitment also reflects this. Like Brentford, the club has expanded its previously UK-centric scouting network to sign players from undervalued European leagues like the Austrian Bundesliga and Polish Ekstraklasse, and players from clubs which rank highly in the pressing metrics are often favoured. For example, in 2020, they signed Dominic Frieser from the aforementioned LASK, as well as Herbie Kane and Isaac Christie Davis from the Liverpool Reserves. But arguably their biggest masterstroke has been the signing of Daryl DK, the MLS's Rookie of the Year in 2020, who arrived on loan in January with a $20 million option to buy. Just about meeting the requirements for a UK work permit after making his US national debut on deadline day, Barnsley were quick to strike, and he adapted quickly to the championship with nine goals in his first 19 appearances, of which the Tykes won 13, sealing their place in the playoffs. If they succeed, the Premier League windfall will easily cover his permanent fee should they choose to pay it. 
For a club which was effectively saved from relegation by Wigan's point deduction in 2020, the progress they have made since is remarkable, and is testament to the idea of sticking with a clear long-term vision even when results don't go your way. Signing a player of DK's quality ahead of bigger spending rivals is further proof of their excellent recruitment strategy, which has seen the club turn a small profit on transfers since 2018, while the likes of Nottingham Forest and Reading have made a loss only to continually miss out on the playoffs. And with the Pacific Media Group now in charge of clubs in Switzerland, France, Denmark and Belgium, they now have direct access to talent pools across Europe, with The Athletic's Matt Slater even branding them the Poundland Red Bull. Like with Brentford, it seems a matter of when, and not if, we see Barnsley in the Premier League. So that was our take on the rise of Brentford and Barnsley, but are there any other lower league clubs you'd like to see us do a deep dive on in the future? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave us a like, and why not click on screen right now for another FD Explained. I'm sure it's a good one. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.